For centuries, my people have been whaling here. It's our culture, our way of life, and it's part of our story. A story that isn't shared enough, but one that needs to be told. If not for you, then for my people's children and their children's children. For the next generation of hunters. This is home, Point of Alaska. My people have lived here for thousands of years. We're hunters and right now since it's spring, it's whaling season. There are 13 whaling captains in Point Hope. Love being out on the ice, this is home. This is who we are, it's Tiki Almi. I'm a Kaumuktuk, which is the one of two clans left. There's the Wessex Cox and Kaumuktuk, and we're part of the Kaumuktuks. A lot of long lineage of whalers. I was always told that we were the only community whaling much, much longer, much, much more before than commercial whaling. And I always believed we were the only ones that whaled before commercial whalers came up. That's my dad and my whaling captain. My appa, or my grandfather, passed the crew down about 10 years ago to my father. My appa's generation has seen the largest changes to whaling due to technology since the introduction of gunpowder. All pretty much equipment like snow machines or something that I've never had when I first went out hunting. It was dog teams, that's all. No snow machines, you know. In my lifetime, every year is something different progressing in, in our culture that is uh, more uh, available to be easy to live in, like I have a house like this, and I have a stove, and uh, all I have to do is put in fuel in it and it'll keep me warm. I don't have to attend to it all day and night. But those days we slept at night. There's no stove burning, but when we wake up, they turn on the stove and make food with it. Culture, still try to maintain our culture with all the different things that are uh, brought in by the Caucasian lifestyle is different, and we accept it because it's easier for all of us. Some things have gotten easier and more efficient, but whaling is never easy. To commit to a season of whaling is a lifestyle choice. It takes a crew both on and off the ice. The men take care of the more demanding physical labor and the women take care of the intricate tasks like sewing or cooking. Every community member knows that they're whalers. It's who they are. Because if you walk around our community, you walk to the old site, See jaw bones everywhere. I know people tend to get them mixed up that come in, you know, think they're ribs, but those are really whale jaw bones, and there's so many of them. They're old. So we've been whaling for quite a few centuries. It's who we are. It's what I love to do, and hopefully raise my boys and my grandson to where they'll, they'll always want to be whalers in their life. It's who they are. A lot of pride in who they are and where they come from. I always tell them you're tiki omiu. Be proud of it. It's just a good life. Good life. It's different every year, you know. Some years you, you can't even go out hunting because uh, you get sick. A bad cold or a pneumonia or something in the waiting season, then your crew is out there hunting for you. But they accept the fact that they're hunting for me and, and for the community. And if they don't go out, they won't get nothing to eat for the community. I even made a sentence out of spelling the word whales, W H. A L E S. I made a sentence out of that. 
I said, will help all living Eskimos survive. Ava doesn't hunt anymore, but we do for him. And hunting starts at sunrise. thick ice that's still attached to the land and the broken spring sea ice that's drifting by. When there's more fractured sea ice in the lead, we don't go out. Here in our spot, or as we call it, the Amu, we keep two boats ready to go, our speed boats and the umak, which is traditionally seal skin. This fiberglass umak was initially Ma'amo's or great grandpa's before being passed down. Each boat has an advantage. One's fast. The other is quiet. We keep harpoons in each so they're ready to go at a moment's notice. The harpoons have an explosive tip. We use these because they're much more efficient at bringing down the whales quickly, especially in comparison to how it used to be done. Because he talked about his grandfather talking about how they used to, um, on a spear, on a lance, they'd put a gangrene, just coat it, cake it, put it over heat, coat it. They'd strike a whale, they'd take off. They'd wait a couple days because they knew it might be coming back. Then when it came back, they'd use a lance and go get it. The methods have changed, but at the end of the day, it's about food about our culture and after waiting on the ice eventually the hunt is on but the bowheads swim through this way each year they know they're being chased. They avoid us for as long as they can. Most get away completely. They're masters of their domain. But we believe when the whale's ready, it will give itself to you. Eventually, the season's first whale was caught. It takes six boats to bring back the first whale. It's a big one. And it's a special whale because it marks the first whale that was killed by a newer whaling captain, Herb. You know, this whaler that just got blessed his first year as a whaling captain, they got to do what they call ibayuk, which is where an elder will go into his home. They can do it once. And they can take any one of his belongings. And they let him know we're here to ibayuk. Ibayuk to act to it and he has to allow them to pick what they want and take what they want. But we view it as your elders have such strong prayers that you're gonna continue to be blessed. And so you always have that open door and you do it from the day you land in the whale until the day of the first day of the whaling feast. They can come in, but they can only come in once. And they have to be elders pretty 
but you're only going to pull. Like when I was blessed to land the wheel, my wife and I, they took, like him, a snow machine, a four-wheeler, shotgun, sewing machines, furs, you know, to sew with. And one of the elders asked me to go buy some, she wanted some, a new dish set. So we went and got that from her from the store. One elder asked me to make her a meat drying rack, so I did that. Just a lot of things like that. Um. If I look aside, the first priority is getting back a 55 foot long bowhead whale so we can get it up on the ice. We use a block and tackle pulley system to bring the whale onto the ice. With a whale this size, the process of getting it onto the ice can take all day. As soon as part of the whale is up on the ice, Herb, the captain who caught the whale, decides it's time for Tedelit, which is when they cut a square out of the back end of the whale for the workers and elders and everyone at the whale helping for them to get a taste of it and motivation for them to work harder. More people show up from the village to help pull the whale up, but the sun is starting to set. Other crews keep hunting into the night hoping to catch another whale. For everyone else who is still willing to work, and for the crews who have shares on the whale, it's time to get over get their meat and muck duck. This is a whale that they catch when they're cutting it up. By the time the whale makes it onto the ice, each crew that helped knows which part of the whale they have claimed to. By who gets who hits it first and hits it second and third and fourth. You know, like I told my boys, I said, if you really want to learn, you watch, watch an older guy. I'll teach you, I'll tell you, and I'll show you. But um, one of the things you can do that'll really help is go yeah. cut up the whale, look at it, look at the body, type of whale, know where the neck is, know where the kidneys are, the heart, all the internal organs, and so when you strike, you can have a good strike. And, uh, job part Boy yeah. whales have around 17 to 19 inches of blubber, or muckduck, that surrounds their body. For them, it's an excellent defense against the cold. For us, it's calorically dense and easily kept all year. Whaling <laughs> is not without its inherent risks. A few hours after this video was shot, 
the wind changed directions and broke a quarter mile of ice off. After the weather calmed down, we had to go make a new umu by creating another path and cutting in a ramp some six feet into the ice for the boats. Even with the risks to feed our people, it's more than worth it. And everybody in our community has a role during the festival. Every time they catch a whale, I go out there and help eat it up. <laughs> Sometime after the snow has melted in mid-June, we have our Kavarok, or three-day whaling festival. During which, the community comes together to celebrate the whales that were caught. I enjoy giving away the meat more than anything. Cutting it up into exact, you know, they gotta be perfect. You can't just cut them any old way. You gotta be just perfect. It's like cutting a steak and, you know, singing, thinning it out. It's the same thing except ours are big, so you have to make them just square. Because people have to eat, you know, it, they have to learn, they have to enjoy it. And then when you do something perfect like that, they enjoy it a lot better. That's my Aka, or my grandma, and she's one of the elders who is passing down lessons to the next generation. I was taught not to be greedy. And then when you're going to give something away, you don't say, you don't say to that person, that's my last piece, I'm giving it to you. You don't say that, you just give it to them. Never say that that's your last piece. Just give them, it'll come back to you. The Kagarok is also when we get together for dancing in Nalukutuk, or blanket toss. <laughs> After days of eating and seeing loved ones, the Kogrok culminates in the gym, where we hand out the meat and muktuk to the community. At the end of the day, all of our work led up to these moments, as it was for our ancestors. Our traditions are our lives, and I know that if they're to survive, they must be passed down. You young folks, try to carry on that tradition. Listen, absorb it, keep it with you, because we always do everything orally, we speak it. So continue to speak it to all your children, what it's about, and everything's going to be just fine. So I dedicate this video to my daughter Lacey's unborn children. May they continue to know the lives that have been so good to us. Thank you.